Former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations John Bolton is a hawk on Iran, a strong supporter of Israel and a highly influential voice in Republican circles. And these days, he's an outspoken critic of his old boss, Donald Trump. So, sticking with the theme of today's program, that it's a dangerous world, what can Western leaders do about it? I asked John Bolton, what are the chances of a second Trump White House and what would that mean for global security? Ambassador Bolton, we're heading for the next stage of the Republican primaries, um, the vote in New Hampshire this week. It looks as though Mr. Trump will be the Republican nominee. Can he beat Joe Biden? Well, he can, and uh, it looks like Biden will be the Democratic nominee, and he can beat Trump. I, I think this election will be much like 2020 and 2016. Uh, in that there will be a large group of voters, and in, in this, this year the largest of the three, a large group of voters who don't like either candidate. And in the end, the winner will be the, the, uh, the candidate who is less disliked by this large group of voters. Not an ideal way to pick a president, but I think people are very unhappy. We're headed toward a rematch of uh, 2020, notwithstanding uh, all that dissatisfaction. It looks like l what will happen, and, and right now that makes November uh, impossible to predict. Okay, but if you were a betting man, um, can we? Are we likely to see another Trump presidency? Well, I think it's entirely possible. I mean, I don't mean to sound pessimistic, but uh, but Biden is deeply unpopular now. He's had some good economic news in the past few days. Consumer confidence is up in the past two months by record amounts. Uh, but people honestly don't don't think he's got the competence to make it through another four year term. And I think that situation, uh, sadly for Joe Biden, but in reality, is not going to get any better as days go by. Uh, I'm going to come back to this because uh, you are, uh, I think it's still a member of the Republican Party. And it's, it's quite interesting to hear you say that it's a pessimistic outlook that Biden can't win. But let me just come back, come on to your particular area of uh, interest and expertise. Foreign affairs look set to play a bigger role in this year's elections than it might normally do, particularly the conflict in the Middle East. Um, this weekend, the uh, Israeli prime minister said that, in effect, Israel would never accept a Palestinian state on its borders. On the other hand, Mr. Biden says that the solution must guarantee a Palestinian state. Um, what do you think a Trump administration would do? I think it would be chaotic and unpredictable. I do think it's important that national security play a larger role in this election. It's been a mistake since the collapse of the Soviet Union in America uh, that we haven't debated enough what's happening, and I think we're beginning to see the consequences of that uh, increase. I, I think a lot of Americans would support Netanyahu's position on the two-state solution, but regardless of how popular it is, the reality on the ground is the two-state solution is dead. Something happened has to be done for the Palestinians. They've been abused. They've made into a, a weapon against Israel for 75 years now. That's, that hasn't gotten anywhere. But the idea that you're going to reconstruct Gaza and build a, a state on that, I, I think, uh, defies reality. The Palestinians were weaponized by radical Arab leaders back in the 50s and 60s because they were still trying to drive Israel into the sea. That is not going to happen. They are not going to return to their quote-unquote country of origin, Israel, especially after October the 7th. So for the good of the Palestinian people, whether they're in Gaza, the West Bank, or wherever they may be, for their own good, for the good of their children, they need to be resettled into viable economies. Well, um, in, in that situation, uh, and you've talked about this uh, in the past, uh, there is, of course, one big actor that might stand in the way of any of that, and that is Iran. Is the United States making a mistake, do you think, that uh, in attacking the proxies for Iran, Hezbollah, uh, the Houthis, uh, even Hamas in some ways, or should it strike directly at Tehran? Well, I think uh, we're seeing right now, with respect to the Houthis, for example, uh, five or perhaps it's now six American strikes. They're, they're still firing missiles and drones at ships in the Red Sea. Iran is not feeling any pain for what's happening here. And what is happening is not a series of discrete, isolated clashes. This is the implementation of what the Iranian leadership calls the ring of fire strategy against Israel, developed by the late unlamented Qasem Soleimani of the Quds Force. 
Uh, Hamas didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, why don't we attack Israel? This was coordinated. This is part of an Iranian plan. We can't discern the full uh, picture of, of what the Iranians have in mind, and they might not be very happy the way it's playing out. But Iran didn't uh, arm and equip and train and finance the Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Shia militia groups in, uh, in Iraq. Uh, to use these resources for their own benefit at their own discretion. Iran did all that so it would have a capability through its proxies to act as it's acting so, now. So would and you... Co- notwithstanding strikes against these proxies, Iran is still at it. So would you still stand by what you've said at times in the past, that actually the United States should simply just take action against Iran? Uh, Absolutely. And I think we could do it. I think we could uh, send several Iranian ships that are in the Red Sea aiding the Houthis. We could send them to the bottom of the Iranian of the Red Sea. Uh, We could attack uh, uh, air defense sites inside Iran. Uh, We could go after uh, military headquarters of the Quds Force. We could go after camps where uh, weapons and training has uh, has uh, have been transferred to various militia groups. Our, our attacks wouldn't necessarily threaten the uh, mullahs in Tehran, but as long as they are uh, engaged in all this uh, activity in the region, cost free to them, they will continue to do it. That we 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 have no deterrence now in in the region, not even for goodness sakes against the Houthis. Let's talk about um, the the relationship between the UK and the United States. When you were National Security Advisor back in 2019, you said that you welcomed Brexit and the United States would quickly negotiate a series of trade deals with the UK to make Brexit work. Uh, When Mr Trump left office 18 months later, those talks hadn't even begun. Well, what actually happened? Well, I would I would put the blame, unfortunately, on the government and the the political parties in uh, in Great Britain. The the remainers uh, lost the vote. Uh, And they simply didn't accept it. And uh, they fought for years, making it almost impossible for successive uh, governments uh, to deal effectively in the trade area with the United States and others. Uh, You know, if you get you you ask for a vote and you lose and you don't like it and you you try and subvert, it sounds a little Trumpian to me. Well, uh, the reason I'm asking this is I, I, I. I'm wondering how you're assessing the relationship between the UK and the United States. Uh, Pentagon sources um, last week criticised our Defence Secretary for an interview he did here, actually on Sky News, in which they say that Mr Shapps let slip that there would be an attack on the Houthis. Um, In Washington, certain in in the um, uh, Ambassador Bolton mind, can the UK be trusted as an ally? Yeah, look, you'd have to be uh, uh, really living on a different planet not to see that pressure was growing to strike the Houthis. Uh, and the circumstances, I think, were increasingly clear. The, the problem with both governments is we didn't strike the Houthis earlier. Uh, and I think, and I, I have certainly welcomed uh, the, the position of successive British governments in providing aid to Ukraine, uh, far more vigorous in advocating and, and proportionally supplying aid to Ukraine than the Biden administration has been. Quickly, the, the, the issue, I guess, is whether in Washington we are thought not just willing but capable. One of our former uh, military leaders, Lord Dannat, has been saying this weekend that um, we, d- we're running down, particularly the British Army. Uh, do Americans think that we are not just a willing but a capable ally? Yeah, look, I I think both uh, the United States and the United Kingdom are going to have to spend substantially more on defense. Right now, uh, U.S. levels about 3 percent of GDP. U.K. is a little bit over uh, 2 percent. I think the U.S. needs to go back to Ronald Reagan era levels, given the threats we see around the world. That's 5 to 6 percent of GDP. Honestly, you should do the same. God knows our friends in Europe have to go from their relatively low levels, almost all of them, to much higher levels. Uh, we all made a mistake when when uh, the Cold War ended. People said history had ended, too, and that it's the economy stupid and nothing else matters. Look at the invasion of Ukraine. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. Look at the Chinese threat uh, to the South China Sea and to Taiwan. History didn't end. Threats exist. Uh, global politics is still dangerous. And if we're not prepared for it, we will find ourselves in a disadvantageous position. A but, strong welfare state, a strong national health system will not defend you against your adversaries.